Joining me right now is Bob Hilla. Bob, great to see you. Great to see you too, Jesse. So, so let's talk a little bit about this case if we can. I mean, we saw the prosecution's closing. We saw the defenses. Now it's the prosecution's last attempt. What are you looking for for them to do here to really hone in on this jury? It's all about the timeline. Uh, they're going to have to tie in the forensic evidence and the observations that, such as the seizure that the defendant had testified to during the trial, to hem her in that these, uh, these injuries and the consequence of her death had to happen while under her care. Do you, does, the, does the timeline make sense to you? I mean, what do you think really happened? Do you think that the prosecution is establishing a strong enough idea here that she, that the defendant was physically abusing this girl on the day in question, the days before? I mean, I think we're still trying to understand exactly how this happened. Well, the critical thing here is they're going for federal, um, felony murder. And so what they're going to be looking for is they, they can prove perhaps that the uh, abuse was excessive to bring it within the... Um, the levels of the law that would trigger that exposure. Um, but they're going to try and focus on uh, the testimony that talked about how the brain swelling progressed so quickly and that it really couldn't happen before the child came under her care. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to think about from this week, including the fact that Lindsay Parton, the defendant herself, testified. Um, all, uh, Jason Weshey, the, v the victim's father, Testified. What did you make of Lindsay Parton first? Let's talk about that because I don't know if it was a great day for her on the stand. I don't know that it's ever great in a trial like this to have the defendant testify. Um, it was interesting that they did, perhaps to try and mitigate the comments in the statement she gave in the two interviews. I, I'm sure that was the defense's um, purpose, and probably they felt that they had to. They had no right. other choice. Um, probably because of the things we talked about in earlier uh, segments of the show, the failure of having the father there left some questions about the prosecution's case and why he wouldn't be called. And I think they had to put that witness out there and, uh, and address the issue of uh, what happened while in his care. The final arguments from both sides. It's now going to be in the hands of the jury to determine the fate of Lindsay Parton. What should we be making of this, Bob? I mean, it's now all in their hands. They have a lot to consider. And, and I think they're going to be spending a lot of time on that forensic medical evidence, and they're going to look at the timing. I think that's where the jury's going to focus. Let me ask you this. The idea of inconsistent statements, lies that the defendant admitted to. I made up this. I didn't mean this. I said this because I thought it was what the police wanted to hear. Um, I never hit... I never hit her after this catch-up incident, or I just said it because one of my friends had hit her child, and I thought it would... She was all over the place at times. That can't help her case. No, it doesn't. Inconsistencies, especially if you're a criminal defendant, um, generally always work against you. Yeah, and that's a good point. I, I guess my question is forensics, right? Do you, I don't know if you had an opportunity to see Dr. Werner Spitz testify, but the idea of providing an alternative idea of timeline, because you said that's a really big idea here about when these injuries occurred, um, how she suffered from them, and what actually caused them. Is the jury going to buy that? Is the jury going to ultimately take that when there was such significant evidence put forward by the state? Well, they're going to be free to accept or reject all or parts or none of the evidence that's been presented to them because the credibility function is going to rest in their hands. The state really has to prove, or wants to prove here, the recklessness of the abuse that was um, uh, performed by the defendant on the child. And if they do, that gets them to the level where they can prove the felony murder mm -hmm. um, can, and, and, and not get manslaughter. Yeah, and the good point, it's not, they, they don't have to show that she intended to kill this girl, but as a result of her actions, this girl died. Bob, interesting case, because this is, we're trying to figure out if this really is a situation of self-defense. What strikes you as working for the defense in terms of a self-defense argument? What's the strongest arguments they're making? Well, the defense has to show really two things. One, that the victim was the aggressor, and two, that the force was reasonable. Right. So I don't think there's any question here um, that the victim was, if not the actual aggressor that initiated it, he agreed to come back with these other people to the scene of the, in, where the dispute started, 
and part, participate in this fight. Uh, so I think uh, the defense is going to have a pretty uh, solid uh, uh, proof of uh, that the, the victim was the aggressor. The other issue is that um, six, the size differential, six foot six guy on top of a five foot seven guy, um, sort of plays into the argument that the uh, response was reasonable. We don't know to what extreme uh, the two were engaged in terms of a struggle. I'm glad you mentioned that because I think the medical examiner testified today and said that Todd, the victim, died from a stab wound to the chest, but under cross-examination by Van Hemert's attorneys was able to get the medical examiner to say that it was possible that he was stabbed while Todd was on top of the defendant. Again, if he can show that he was under that imminent threat, you know, if he's being beat up and he takes the knife out, still, a knife, uh, if one person has a weapon and the other person doesn't have a weapon, is that ever self-defense? I, I think it is. It, it, you basically have to, is, was, it, was it reasonable for the individual to be in fear for their own safety um, and imminent harm and, and reasonable to respond that way? Right. And the only thing that was handy, you heard the other def uh, witness say he had a rock and he let the rock go because mm. he was told to. But he picked up a rock because he thought he'd need it. Right. Uh, this person obviously had something sharp, uh, the defendant, on him. Um, and as the fight escalated, he didn't show it right away. Right. So he drew it in response to the struggle he was engaged in with someone who was almost uh, eight inches taller than he was. Joining me is trial attorney Bob Hilla. He's back with us. One of the interesting things about this self-defense case is you got the jury has a tough job here in the sense that the witness is testifying on behalf of the state and those testifying on behalf of the defense. I'm saying it's friends and family of both sides, right, who were involved there. It's a credibility issue for both sides. I mean, don't both sides want to you know, say that, hey, the friends who are of Marquise Todd want to say he was the victim. The friends of uh, the defendant want to say he was the victim. How does the jury, you know, sort this out? I mean, the first thing they're going to have to look at all the evidence, but they're going to see that none of these kids intended to kill anybody in this mm -hmm, fight. Mm -hmm. It was it was unfortunate that it what it became an issue of uh, push back on each side, and then it escalated to a point uh, where. Uh, somebody did something that now they're being on trial for. Let me ask you this. The incident, this stabbing, occurring outside of the home of Luke Van Hemmert, outside of his property, what is the, how does that affect the analysis? Well, I think it, it goes to the aggressor comments that, um, you know, they were there where they had a right to be, and the other party showed up after already departing the area and coming back mm. to settle the score or, or address some dispute now that just got out of hand. But from a legal point of view, even if Ta, even if this person who originally got into the altercation with Luke Van Hammer was not the victim, uh, the victim, Marquise Todd, came back later on, even if he came back to the scene to confront Van Hemmer, that doesn't immediately mean he's the aggressor, and that doesn't immediately mean that this is a case of self-defense, right? No, that's right. That, that's, uh, that's accurate. And uh, again, at some point in time, you can even have a retreat situation where, you know, the fight breaks, and then somebody uh, goes back into it and elevates the level of... Uh, of force, and then it gets unreasonable. Bob, he gets punched in the face and doesn't really see what happens with Luke, uh, the defendant. So how valuable is his testimony? Well, what's interesting, the other witness before said, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, he saw the defendant charging. So the question is, was the defendant charging because he was being an aggressor? Or did the defendant charge when he saw his friend punched in the face and was trying to come to his aid, and then that just escalated the fight? That's a good point. Just to tell everybody, this was outside of Luke Van Hemmert's home. When you hear Stan or Stanley, that's the defendant's father. This all happened right there. The question is, is you know, we're trying to understand who was the actual aggressor and what happened. Are you getting a clearer sense based upon these witnesses what happened? I, I think from looking at the witnesses, and, and I would suspect that the trial's gonna go this way, is that it was a melee, you know? Yeah. You had somebody pulled the trigger on somebody else's um, emotions or anger, and then it got physical, and then it just kept escalating, and then it got out of hand. And when it's so chaotic, who knows what's actually happening? Let me just ask you this real quick. 
he lost his bid to get this as a stand your ground case. So for in other words, the defendant went to a judge, said, I want immunity, stand your ground. This is the same kind of thing that it is in Florida. The judge denied that. Why did the judge deny that? My understanding is that the judge denied that um, because um, he felt there was no hearing requirement or procedural requirement in the law itself. Uh, it also didn't say what standard he needed to do uh, to apply in that case, a re reasonable doubt standard, clear and convincing standard, like they do in some ins cases with insanity defenses sure. or, or a preponderance standard, which means when you just have the scales of justice and the evidence weighs a little bit more in favor of somebody else, they win on that issue. And now it's all in the hands of the jury, or will be in the hands of the jury. All right, and you're listening to the moments when Marquise Todd was stabbed. The question again, is this self-defense? And really, we're, we're trying to understand, Bob, what is the law in Iowa? We talked about earlier that the defendant made a petition to the judge to have this case thrown out understand your ground, which basically in Iowa would mean he didn't have a duty to retreat. Uh, he didn't have to run away before using uh, deadly force, before using reasonable force. It, but what is this case, what's the central issue? That he had to stay in his home? Is it that he shouldn't have used a knife when getting into a fist fight? I mean, can you break it down for us? I think what this case is gonna come down to, at least from what I'm seeing so far, is uh, whether the degree of force that was utilized here was necessary. Sure. And re reasonable, really, is what the... And, of course, if he was reasonably in fear for his life or his physical safety, then he was entitled to use force necessary and, and equal to uh, not... Uh, to preventing the harm that was going to be caused uh, in the force that was used against him. So It's an interesting argument because one way you could say, hey, he could have gone back into his house called 911. Right. right. The other way is, well, if he had people right outside of his property, you know, he has a duty to protect himself and his family in there. What, what these stand your ground laws kind of do is they extend what the law looked at, for instance, in burglary cases when somebody breaks in your home and then you're not required to leave your home. You're, you're allowed to defend yourself and your home, um, but you need to do that reasonably. So if you strike somebody and you sure. render them immobile, uh, then you call the police, that's reasonable force. Um, but if uh, you strike someone, they're immobile, and then you take out a gun, you shoot them while they're laying on the ground, that's not reasonable. Bob, let me ask you this. Did the defense do an adequate job of putting the blame on Hannah's father, Jason Weshey? I think in the segment we just saw, they did a great job of that. Uh, they compressed the time frame when this child was in the care of the defendant and of course, this whole case is going to be about whether the injury leading to the death occurred while in the care of the defendant. Now, the defendant doesn't have to cause the injury. The defendant also can contribute to the injury um, to still support a conviction. But if they don't believe that the injury was either um, um, enhanced by her actions in the care of the child um, or that it occurred before, um, then she may not even get convicted of the child endangerment. Well, how, how, do you, how do you think that? I mean, I'm, I'm, how, how would we get there? Well, I think that they're going to look very carefully at this compressed timeline. Sure. They're going to look very carefully at what the forensic medical evidence said happened to this child um, perhaps before the child got to her and also with respect to the progression of the injury afterwards. Um, the shorter the timeline in her care, the better it is for the defendant, because then it starts to look like uh, the father dropped this child off as a cover for himself. This child starts to go rapidly downhill. God knows what happened before then. And now all of a sudden, you know, it looks like the caregiver was the one that caused the death rather than the father. That's why the prosecution, though, says she hit this child on pro days before she eventually was taken to the hospital. The thing to remember, I think, as well, is the fact that we're still trying to understand if she was hit by, this, by the defendant, and the defendant admits to hitting her, shaking her, slapping her across the face, that how soon after would those injuries, would she get those kinds of symptoms where she wouldn't be herself, she would exhibit um, those kinds of symptoms and then ultimately collapse. You know, this girl only took so much. That's another theory. According to the one physician, uh, the pediatrician that testified, um, those injuries that they uh, saw on the CAT scans were happening, happening right. rapidly. 
right. which would indicate that they were recently um, incurred. So the question is, you know, how recent? Um, also, right. you know, reasonable doubt if the defense, and in this case, with that compressed timeline, and the father is a wild card, um, you don't have to prove um, that someone else did it, but if you can sow the doubt that sure. there's another logical explanation here, the jury can seize on that and can say, you know what, we have a fair doubt here with respect to the cause of this. Bob, there's one thing that doesn't make sense to me, right? Obviously, there's a question about did she hit this child, shake this child in that minute and 30 seconds before she you know, ultimately calls the uh, Jason Weshi. But if she didn't touch her at that point, maybe it was sh too short of a time, then are we su supposed to believe that Hannah was going to collapse at that moment in time, whether she was in Jason Weshi's car, whether she was in Lindsay Parton's home, whether she was in Jason Weshi's home? I mean, was it just a, a matter of her, she, there was so much more she could take? Because that's the thing that strikes me as odd. What f caused her to collapse at that very moment? Do you have a, is this clear to you? It's not clear. Um, what's interesting here is he talks about her lying in the car, which was not usual, and carrying her in. And then the child shortly thereafter is not responsive. So, you know, I think the jury's going to ask, most likely, to read back and compare the testimony from the father with the defendant. They're going to look at that compressed timeline and then go back to the evidence relating to how quickly the injury progressed. Um, yeah, the problem is, is that you don't have the defendant here saying, he just carried her in, put her on the couch, I noticed she wasn't responding, and then right. I was shaking her, trying to get her to come to, and she still didn't respond, and I thought something was wrong, and then I called. She doesn't say that. She says that the child was actually communicative, communicating and moving around. Well, she said, you know, in one story, she said she walked in, and Hannah asked for a donut and couch, and she just bam, fell. It doesn't make sense uh, that this child would have just dropped, you know, to the ground unless something happened at that moment. It just seems so convenient for the prosecution that that happened right at her home. But that's the thing that strikes me as odd. And, and I guess the question is the jury's probably considering right now, what happened before March 8th, right? What happened to those injuries? Do you believe that they think it's a fall or not? I don't know. I, I think right now they're not sure. I think just what you said, they're concerned about uh, the defendant's testimony because it, it doesn't add up. You would think that the defendant's testimony would be different, as you pointed out, right? in light of what the father said the child's condition was when he brought her in the house. Um, but perhaps maybe something also happened there, and it was, that's what I said before. The jury could look at it as a cumulative effect, that maybe this child already had some serious problems and now that the caregiver, you know, make those problems worse. And welcome back everybody. So let's just now take our final moments and talk about what might be happening in the Lindsay Parton case. Uh, again, Bob, I mean, we were talking about it. The defense said it was where we were gonna play, but unfortunately we didn't have enough time where the defense basically questioned Jason Weshi. Hey, maybe you're responsible. Is it not possible that she fell up in your car? You know, you didn't buckle her in the right way. She, her head hit in the car. It's an alternative theory because if that happened, you'd be responsible. What's the jury thinking about about all these different theories of what happened to this young girl? They're going to try and remove, first of all, any reasonable doubt with respect to the, um, the cause of the injuries. So they're going to try and determine whether or not uh, she impacted what led to this child's death, meaning the defendant. Um, they're also going to look at whether the father could have caused that, and if that was the case, um, then there might be an acquittal here. In your expert opinion, when do you think we're getting a verdict? I think it's going to be a while. I think they're not today, um, probably not tomorrow. I think they're going to want to look at a lot of things before they make the decision. It's a tough case. It is a tough case. I mean, it's tough because in the sense there's only really two people who really know what happened, right? And they, is, this, is this a credibility issue? Do they believe the father or do they believe the babysitter? Well, there's certainly two people that know the version of what really happened. Um, I'm not sure either one really understands what actually happened and caused this child to die, but it's very possible both had a hand in it. And if they, again, the idea is she didn't intend to kill this girl, but as a result of what she did, the girl died. Um, it's going to be tough, but uh, do you think that we might see a situation where she'd be found guilty across the board? Do you see a situation where it might be a mistrial? I mean, 
We have about 20 seconds left. More likely um, child endangerment charges. Um, most likely, uh, or less likely, the uh, manslaughter. Bob Hilla, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate your insight as always. Thank you.